Imagine you're walking on a frozen river, the icy surface beneath your feet solid and unyielding. It's snowy and the crisp and frosty wind bites your face. You can't see much through the snow, but from what you can make out, the world around you seems fixed and unchanging. It's quiet and also lifeless and empty. There's even a kind of stillness to the uniform blowing of the flurries. But then something changes. Cracks begin to form in the ice, small at first, barely noticeable. With each passing moment, they gradually begin to widen and deepen though, and you start to get scared. You look into one of the cracks and what you see terrifies you. Nothing, just a dark and vacant void in the river below. As the cracks spread, the ice below your feet gives way and you find yourself plunged into the water. You struggle to stay afloat. You're now in a world that's alien and hostile. The freezing river is overwhelming. You're full of panic. All you want to do is rewind time to get back to dry land. You start to get tired of treading. Your face dips below the waterline. This scene from the film, It's Such a Beautiful Day, has stuck with me since I first saw it years ago. Watching it back then, it seemed to reveal something true about people and about reality. That we're just physical processes, collections of atoms which make up molecules, which then make up organs and tissues and brains. That we're just brains then, riding around in bodies. This this was a precious insight for me at the time. It helped me put things in perspective, made me more sympathetic towards others. It was and still is a reminder of both our connectedness and our fragility. But as I've reflected on this scene over the years, I've come to believe that there's something missing from this picture. This missing piece is partly due to kind of the broader reductionist and materialist worldview that has come to dominate much of modern thought. The idea that, well, it might seem obvious or self-evident to some, but The idea is that phenomena, complex or simple, from the motion of the stars to the feeling of friendship, are all best explained in terms of their most basic constituents, reduced to the bottom. Now this perspective, which has been blossoming since the Enlightenment, has yielded tremendous scientific and technological progress. But its assumptions and consequences also have limitations and dangers. There isn't anything more true about describing things at the most reduced level. In fact, reducing the complexity of human experience to biological or physical mechanisms fails to fully capture the depth and richness of being alive. We aren't just atoms, or just molecules, or just brains. I mean, we definitely are all those things, but we're also experiencing beings, and that's possibly the most interesting thing about us. If you're not quite with me so far, that's okay. Stick around for a little bit longer and what I'm trying to say might become a little clearer. In this video, we'll explore how our tendency to privilege a reductionist perspective might contribute to the experience of depression, and how incorporating other ways of relating to ourselves and the world can open up new possibilities for transformation. I'm going to be using the word depression in a broad and colloquial way, referring to what most people think of when they think of depression. I'm not explicitly talking about major depressive disorder as diagnosed in the DSM-5, I'm not a diagnostician. Also, some or all of what I'm saying may not resonate with you or might conflict with your experience. Depression is very complex and means many different things to many different people in different contexts. I'm not aiming to provide an all-encompassing theory of depression. This video doesn't have all the answers. It's an exploration. Take what's helpful or inspiring and leave the rest. Depression often involves a radical disruption in the nature of our experience. The once familiar figures and objects and people and activities that make up our lives start to seem obscure and drained of color and meaning. People frequently report a sense that everything feels the same, and it's all just matter. 
Andrew Solomon in The Noonday Demon describes this shift vividly. He talks about the idea of taking pleasure in things becoming unreachable, unfathomable. But it's not just pleasure. Depression also seems to be related to changes in our capacity to love, to work, to think clearly, to connect with others, appreciate beauty, hope for joy. This sense of estrangement is not just sadness, though. It's a fundamental shift in the way we are attuned to and embedded in the world. The shift happens at the level before thoughts, before emotions, before interpretations, or even sensations. It's like if someone swapped your normal glasses with monochrome glasses, black and white. The world that appears to you would seem different. It's not that what you're seeing is not real, or that what you saw with your other glasses, your normal glasses, was not real, but just that you're seeing it differently. And there are things that you'd be missing without even knowing you're missing them. When our sense of the world becomes altered like this, it can make it difficult to connect with others in the same way we used to. A friend could show you a new blue shirt that they're excited about, and you might find yourself thinking, it doesn't look so special to me, it looks like the rest of their shirts. You might assume they're being dramatic or have bad taste, when actually you're both just perceiving and sensing the world differently. You might start resenting people who seem to find joy in selecting their clothes for the day, or painting with watercolors, or designing posters. You might think, they're all fooling themselves. There's no point in bothering with that stuff. It doesn't make any difference. Often the connection with others and purpose that once sustained us becomes invisible. This can lead to a pervasive feeling of isolation and emptiness, like being trapped in a frozen tundra alone. But what exactly is lost, right? We were using the analogy with monochrome glasses before. In that case, color is gone. Color is lost. But with depression, what is it that's missing? Well, philosopher Sarah Mergen posits that what's missing is the ineffable, which literally means that which cannot be described in words. The experiences or understandings that are too subtle, too complex, too profound, or just too formless to be captured by language. She describes the ineffable as the symbolic dimension of existence, saying that this layer of our experience imbues life with depth and meaning. Think back to a time when you were listening to a piece of music that resonated deeply with you. You likely felt something. Maybe you'd call it pleasure or joy or nostalgia. But I'd be willing to bet that those don't quite capture the experience, those words. Imagine trying to describe the experience to someone else. You might mention the song name, the artist, the genre, but these obviously don't capture what you felt, do they? You could talk about the specific instruments, the lyrics, the structure of the composition. Or you could use descriptors like chill, intense, ecstatic, bittersweet, but these fall short too. There's something about the experience that defies description. Something that you can gesture towards, but you can't hold in your hand. Something that can only be felt and understood intuitively as a whole not reduced to anything except what it is. I mean, this is art, right? This is probably a topic for a whole other video, but I'll just briefly say music and art more generally often stirs up a soup of emotions, memories, dreams, thoughts, desires, associations to create this, a singular experience that can't be captured in, in words. Sometimes people look at art like a riddle to try to figure it out, find out its point. That would be treating it as a sign and not a symbol. A sign and not a symbol? In Jungian psychology, the ineffable is often associated with Carl Jung's notion of the symbol, which is different in specific ways from a sign. A sign represents something known. It clearly and straightforwardly directs to something literal. A symbol, on the other hand, is an image or an object or an idea or a metaphor that gestures towards something partially unknown or not fully conscious. The meaning of symbols are often slippery, expansive, and vast and can't fully be expressed in words. Let's think of a common and potent symbol, a tree. For most of us living on Earth, trees appear in truly countless stories, memories, myths, dreams. They pepper our lives. Trees are at the same time symbols of growth, renewal, the cyclical nature of life, peace, strength, wisdom, the structure of reality. They have roots that reach deep into the earth and branches that stretch up to the sky. Trees mean healing, they mean purity, 
They also mean danger and darkness. Think of the dark forest in classic fairy tales. The meaning of a symbol is bottomless. It's like a horizon that recedes as you approach it. Symbols have a numinous, almost mystical quality. They speak to us on an intuitive level, and in many ways, symbols are the language of meaning. If you have a goal, let's say you really want this job designing album art at your favorite record label. You could list the reasons you want it, the money, the people you'll be around, the work you'll be doing, but what's really going on? You want the job because of what it symbolizes, what it means, what it means to you and to others. Maybe to you, the job symbolizes success and acceptance and social validation and proficiency and adventure and acknowledgement. And it symbolizes the beautiful experiences you've had listening to the label's music. Maybe it symbolizes the people you listen to that music with. Maybe it symbolizes stability and decadence and connects with others who you've looked up to with similar jobs who symbolize all of these things and more. Hopefully you can see what I'm getting at. Farther even from this, all of our actions, our relationships, our feelings and our preferences, the things we do with others and the things we do when no one's watching, all of this has symbolic depth. Ineffable and expansive layers of meaning rippling all the way down. Accessing and interfacing with these meanings is how we make meaning in our lives. So we make meaning in our lives through symbols. So Mergen's suggestion that depression can develop if we stop engaging with the ineffable starts to make sense now. If we lose this connection with the ineffable, any ambiguity or mystery is simply ignorance, a riddle to be solved later. Any motion is simply the shedding of previous misconceptions. All difference or change or movement itself is an illusion. If we stop seeking or believing in meaning beyond the literal and the logical, or the measurable and the provable, we ignore the symbolic layer of reality and we're left without meaning, meaning itself. Without meaning, we start asking ourselves, why? Why do anything? What's the point? We're all gonna die anyways. Why play this game or why get lunch with my friend? Why go for a walk? These questions are the logical conclusion of an assumption that meaning is a sign. If you're looking for a literal and provable and straightforward answer to what's the meaning of my life, what's my purpose? If you don't find anything, you'll probably eventually conclude that there is no meaning, there is no answer. But of course you won't find anything. It's like asking what's the meaning of a tree. Remember, before when I talked about the tree's meanings, it sure does have some, but one might say this tree has no objective meanings or further, life has no objective meanings. Okay, technically true, but that's a bit of an unfair way of looking at things. It's like saying the concept of love has no objective length or width. Yeah, it doesn't. Why should it though? Here's another example. Let's go back to our metaphor of the monochrome glasses. To ask about the meaning of life and expect an answer is akin to concluding that red and blue don't exist because they go away when you put on the glasses. You might even say that what we call red is just an electromagnetic wave with a wavelength of 700 nanometers. But is this true? Is red just electromagnetic waves? Think about that for a second. Is red that and also fire, and also roses, and also the Liberal Party of Canada, and also love, and also the cover of the notebook I kept in high school, and therefore red is also heartbreak, and also my mom's shirt when I was homesick from school at 12 that smelled like chicken noodle soup, and therefore also comfort and care, and also red is chicken noodle soup, and also for some reason the number six, and also the devil, and also Manchester United, and I... Okay, I think I got my point across. I'm gonna pause now and take a moment to emphasize that I'm not saying depression is caused by the way one thinks. It's not all about changing your mindset. The monochrome glasses don't represent your mindset. They're not a way of thinking. Disconnection from the ineffable doesn't happen due to the way you're thinking. It's actually the other way around. Mergen explains this in her fantastic podcast series, Catabasis Anabasis, 
which I highly recommend, by the way. In her words, what we think and feel is not how the world actually presents itself to us. She says, what we think and feel is how we're reacting to the world as it presents itself to us. She goes on to clarify, the boundaries of our world are built upon what we have experienced, what associations we make, what meanings we perceive, and critically, what we can imagine to be possible. This is simply not something we can change through thinking about it. Let's unpack that for a moment. She's talking about the boundaries of what we can think and feel. The world is presented to us, first through our senses, then through the monochrome glasses, and only after that can we think and feel things about it. Unless we change out our glasses, it's going to be really hard to see color. This is what leads Mergen to her assertion that the opposite of depression is not necessarily happiness or joy or motivation or productivity. The opposite of depression is expansion. Now, if this is feeling a bit shaky, don't worry. It was a bit hard for me to wrap my head around at first as well. Mergen gives us a helpful metaphor, which might clear up some of the fog. While I go through the metaphor, try to keep her assertion in your mind. The opposite of depression is expansion. She tells us to think of depression like being stuck in a room that you find incredibly ugly, that you just think is viscerally gross. To make matters worse, someone has taken everything out, everything that used to make this room tolerable, and also, you think they might have shrunk in the room a little bit somehow? The room is, in her words, no longer set up for sustaining life. They took the sink, there's no toilet, no bed, Maybe there's a bucket of gruel left out for you. You sleep on the floor and relieve yourself in the corner. At some point, you might think, no one is going to convince me that this room is not awful. She explains that this thought is neither rational nor irrational, because at its heart, it's, it's a problem of perception, or perhaps lack thereof. It does seem a bit ineffective, and maybe even in certain contexts, rude, to ask this person to change their mind about how they feel about the objects in this room and the room itself. Now, it can definitely be helpful in many ways for some people and in some rooms, especially when not all of the essential furniture and appliances and other stuff are gone, decorations. Just like reorganizing the room could also be helpful. It could make it a much nicer space to live in, though it probably wouldn't help with the problem of the missing toilet. At some point, you're going to need to bring in new furniture. You're going to want to replace the stuff that's gone and maybe even upgrade some things and maybe, who knows, get new stuff that you didn't have before. You're thinking, here we go. I'm going to make this room livable. I'm going to make it comfortable. So you get your toilet and your bed and your sink and you're trying to install them, but you can't get them to fit. The walls aren't set up for plumbing. The room is shaped like an L, so the bed doesn't even fit. It doesn't fit in the room at all. You think to yourself, just what I thought. This is just how the room is going to be. This is how it's meant to be. This is how it will always be. There's no way around it. The constriction of meaning we were exploring earlier can, as you can see, also be a constriction of possibility. This room is this room. It's shaped like it's shaped. It has always been this way and will always be. There are no possibilities here. Let's think about it. Is that true? There's no way around it. I mean, I'm sure it would seem that way. This is the room. But what if you could transform the room? If you could renovate, knock down a bunch of those walls, make them wider, install plumbing and running water, raise the ceilings, maybe put some pictures up, install a fireplace and some windows. During that time, sure, it might get worse. There'd be dust everywhere and construction and you'd be open to the elements. You wouldn't have walls. You wouldn't have a room. Who knows how long it will take? Renovations go wrong all the time. This is probably why you'd never considered it. It seemed like a terrible process, a step back. Like it would be even more dangerous, more uncertain, more uncomfortable than the status quo of just living in this ugly room. This brings us again to the reductionist, materialist perspective. The one that we touched on earlier. The ugly room, just like the materialist perspective, it grounds you. It keeps everything secure. It limits risk, but at a cost. It also restricts what experiences it's possible for you to have, for you to even conceive of. 
It eliminates the possibility of the new. By knocking down the walls, you've now changed what's possible. What's the opposite of depression? That's why Mergen refers to the next step of transformation through depression as a sacrifice. You're sacrificing the world you know and releasing yourself into one that is uncertain, unknown, and ineffable. It would be perfectly reasonable to question this, I think. You might counter with, there are lots of things that are not changeable. They're just not. There are limitations. What about illness or material conditions, money? Totally true. There are. There are tons of things that are not changeable. What Mergen is, I think, wisely saying is that there's an important difference between the limits of our imagination and the limits of our material conditions. And mistaking the former for the latter can lead to being stuck in this room forever. Sacrificing your grounding, your world as it is, is terrifying. It sounds terrifying and it is terrifying. You can instead uh, learn to appreciate the ugly room and, and your life in there. You can make it as comfortable as possible. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Maybe that would be perfectly fine. There's no right way to live. But transformation doesn't often come from changing how you think about your life, but through experiences, through expanding the space of what you can imagine is possible. What's the opposite of depression? Sacrificing the room as it is and has been, is deeply unsettling. You can't know what the completed renovations will look like or feel like. You can't know if you'll end up missing this tiny, ugly, poorly lit room. It's unsettling, and it is also the first step on the path towards a nice big square room with lots of natural light and a working toilet. In the novel, The Bell Jar, the protagonist, Esther, describes this suffocating sense of confinement. I couldn't see the point of getting up, she says. I had nothing to look forward to. For Esther, even the most mundane tasks and decisions, not to mention those she once enjoyed, feel overwhelming, as if they're weighed down by a heavy sense of futility. This constriction of possibility is one of the defining features of the experience of depression, like we've been talking about. This extends past how we see the world, but also includes how we see the course of our lives. The future, instead of looking like a panoramic landscape of possible routes and obstacles and lives and histories and unimaginable curiosities, it just looks like an, an endless tunnel, offering nothing more than the same darkness and musty air. So here's why it's not so simple to describe depression in terms of these symptom words that we're used to, like feeling sad or unmotivated. It's because depression is really being fundamentally cut off from a sense of agency, of vitality, of, of hope. So let's take this seriously, these questions. Why do anything if nothing's gonna change? And what's the point of trying if it's probably not gonna lead to anything? Or why bother playing this or practicing that if I won't be able to get there or have what they have. All these questions, they hold the assumption that in order to be meaningful, something needs to be a sign. It needs to point to something else, lead to something else. But I think these questions can't actually be answered provably using formal logic. They can only be explored in the dimension of the symbolic. What's the purpose of playing this game? The purpose is the game's meaning. The purpose is not what you get out of it or what it leads to, it's the game's symbolic resonance in that moment. When attuned to the symbolic, we are motivated implicitly by meaning, by values, by the meaning of acting according to values. And those actions then become inherently meaningful in and of themselves. If we approach our lives as if only that which can be clearly described and pinned down is real and worthwhile, we lose touch with an essential dimension of human experience. So of course this can lead us to feeling disconnected, aimless, unable to find fulfillment in our lives, cut off from the part of our experience where enchantment and mystery live. We can find ourselves trapped in a flattened, disenchanted reality, like a barren, frozen landscape drained of color and life. 
a barren, frozen landscape. Do you remember the beginning of this video? I asked you to imagine you were walking on a frozen river when the ice cracked and you fell in. That's a visceral image, no? It seems like things got way worse for you. When we left off, you were soaked and frantically treading, trying to keep your head above water. You'd begun to get tired. Up there, it was cold and dead and empty, but at least you were on land, kind of. And you were making it through, kind of. Well, let's continue this story. After some time, with your wet clothes weighing you down, you have no choice but to surrender to the water. As you sink deeper down into the depths of the river, your world changes. The familiar landscape of just some moments ago has become scary and disorienting. You're isolated from the place you've known, the land. You're shocked by the contrast with the stable, solid ground you'd taken for granted. But then, as your eyes adjust to the water, and the sunlight starts to peek through the cracks in the ice, something happens. Something strange and confusing and beautiful. You look around and you realize that beneath the surface, the river is teeming with life. Fish dancing and lilting in winding motions. Plants swaying in the underwater currents, a whole hidden world pulsing with vitality and, and meaning, and meaning. You also realize, for some reason, that you can breathe. You don't understand it, but it's happening. You're still confused, you're still nervous, you're still cold, but you're starting to get used to it a little bit. The space of what's possible in your life, what's possible in reality, has just drastically changed in a way that you could have never predicted. You think for a second and realize you could have come down here ages ago. You could have cracked the frozen surface of the river yourself and jumped in. But that would have taken some courage. Courage, not fearlessness. Of course you would have been scared. Who wouldn't be? Courage is not the absence of fear, but actually acting in spite of fear. Courage necessitates fear. Without fear, there is no opportunity for courage. This is what I mean by breaking through the ice. So, within the complete and blinding suffering we've been exploring, that is depression, there may actually be the seeds of transformation. Not just recovery, but transformation. Now I know that sounds a bit cliche, and I wouldn't blame you if you're rolling your eyes right now, but bear with me. Depression can be understood as a struggle between the old self that is dying and the new self that is waiting to be born. Remember, we were talking about sacrifice. From this perspective, the pain of depression can be taken as a call to imagination, to confronting and reshaping the constricted patterns of living that have held us back. Mergen talks about depression as a clue that there's something that we're holding on to that is out of touch with reality or ourselves. Something that is no longer possible or never was that we can't let go of. I mean, should we try to find that? Should we try to sacrifice it? Depression is, it's an invitation. However unwelcome, to be honest with ourselves about the real potentials we have in our lives and the real limitations in our way. We often take for granted how much we lie to ourselves. We tend to do this based on fear, but also based on a sense that maybe if we accept things that are painful or parts of ourselves that we despise, we somehow endorse them or we become them. But acknowledging that something is there doesn't mean you think that it should be. To the contrary, actually. Acknowledging it puts you in a place to actually do something about it, to grapple with it and address it and get to know it. To accept and acknowledge even the distressing or scary parts of ourselves and our lives, we become less divided, more fully and uniquely ourselves. If we admit that certain limitations might not be as restrictive as we think, or the opposite, that some limitations are, are actually there and real, then it means that our way of experiencing the world is going to change. It means that there might be other ways of living totally alien to us. This is terrifying. It means introducing uncertainty. It means introducing risk. The other option, though, is denying uncertainty. 
uncertainty that is there nonetheless. The other option is fooling ourselves. To do this also means to live authentically. It means we can start to build lives which are both expansive and possible. It means we can be liberated from regret and resentment because we can actually own our decisions, good and bad. We can accept our limitations and we can also test their limits. Now, this is not to glorify depression or minimize its very real dangers and difficulties, but it is to recognize that even our darkest struggles can contain the seeds of a new life, of transformation. Transformation is the goal of existential therapy, as described by psychologist Kirk Schneider. Rather than simply trying to numb emotional pain or correct so-called irrational thoughts, existential therapy encourages facing and addressing reality head on, all of it, including the depths of despair. The approach has its roots in the thinking of philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche, who spoke about the great value in confronting rather than avoiding suffering. Nietzsche believed that struggle can be an opportunity to strengthen and develop our will, our sense of freedom and conviction. We have a choice. We can resent our suffering. We can dwell on the, the causes of it and who's to blame. Or we can accept our suffering. And in doing that, we can take control of our lives. If your house gets demolished in a wild storm, you can't build a new one until you accept that your old one is gone. Another existential therapist, Viktor Frankl, himself a Holocaust survivor, similarly found that even in the most dire circumstances, humans can find meaning in the choice of how to face their fate. Existential therapists typically see their role in therapy as that of a fellow traveler, rather than a detached clinician or expert. The therapeutic relationship itself then becomes a staging ground for two people to have real genuine encounters with life's paradoxes and contradictions, for letting in the ineffable, for accessing the symbolic layer of existence and holding it simultaneously with both the rational and the material, holding at the same time terror and wonder, rage and curiosity, despair and inspiration, all the agonies and ecstasies of living. At its core, existential therapy is about cultivating presence, about cultivating a whole body awareness of our sensations, thoughts, feelings, and then all of this in relation to the world. By saying yes to our lives, in all their chaos and beauty, by opening up to the full dimensionality of the human experience, we can liberate our capacity to really experience the richness and depth of being alive. So there it is. We've come a long way. Should we take it to heart then? Those old stories of our lives, the ones that we've been told and also the ones we've been telling ourselves for so long that we've forgotten they're there. The ones we've internalized, the ones that come from our parents, from our culture, our religion, our friends, our peers, our traumas. These stories, should we permit ourselves the courage to, to let them thaw and crack? Knowing that beneath the ice, there might be a bizarre and fascinating living world waiting to be found. I guess, what's the other option? Everything stays the same. The path of transformation is marked by both suffering and grace in equal measure. It's not avoiding pain and increasing pleasure. It's falling in love with it all. Leonard Cohen beautifully saying, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. <laughs> <laughs>